Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Yes, We're Here. I'm Jack Curry, and I'm happy to be joined by a familiar face. Bernie Williams, the former Yankee, the beloved Yankee, joins me. And Bernie, I have to ask you, during this trying, difficult time, how is everything going in Bernie Williams' world? It's going well. I mean, I'll tell you, it's really, really uh, strange, you know. Uh, by the way, you know, I want to say hi to everybody out there uh, uh, watching and listening. Uh, it's been really, really strange uh, to have this kind of time to, I'm using it kind of like a resetting time. You know, it's like one of those times that rarely ever happens in my life where you get, you know, an opportunity to sort of reset and figure out, you know, what direction you want to take your life. Uh, uh, you know, at this time, usually, you know, for the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I've been really busy doing a lot of uh, uh, stuff, you know, whether it's my music or the baseball or charity events or things like that. And now it's just so strange to have this uh, kind of an opportunity to uh, kind of contemplate and, and uh, still be productive, but at, at the same time, uh, having a lot of limitations in, in where you can go. Bernie, you're the rarest of breeds in that we always hear musicians want to be pro athletes, pro athletes want to be musicians. You've had both of them covered in your career. I'm going to get to the music in a second because I've seen you perform and I, I love watching you perform. But I do want to start out with baseball. You never wanted to take that uniform off. I, I think you'd still be playing today if they had allowed you to keep playing. What do you miss the most about baseball? Uh, what I miss the most about baseball is the competition. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was great to have the perks and to have the notoriety and the fame and just to wear that pinstrap uniform, you know, all those years was uh, certainly great. Uh, but, you know, what really kept me up at night and uh, what kept me going and the drive and uh, the motivation to be a better player every day was because I wanted to face, to be at my best, facing the competition that we were facing back in those years, facing the Pedro Martinez and the Roger Clemens and, uh, you know, all those, you know, all those great players. And you have to be at the top of your game. Uh, and competing, you know, competing on a, on a daily basis, you know, those three and a half, four hours that I spent uh, not knowing what was going to happen, if I was going to be the hero or the GOAT or both. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was just great uh, to have that uh, in my life at that time. There's not a Pedro Martinez on stage, essentially, with you when you're performing. But is there something in the music world that equates to that? Is, is it competing against yourself? Is it competing within a band? Is there something that fills that competition void now that baseball is not something that you do anymore? Well, I think it, uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, but I kind of approach music in many ways the same way that I approach, you know, my training in baseball. When it came down to the training, it was all about muscle memory, you know, uh, learning all those scales and arpeggios and all those, you know, techniques, you know, for the guitar, which is the same thing that I did in baseball, you know, soft toss, you know, batting practice cage work is all the same uh, uh however uh i know for a fact that half of the stadium <laughs> at least was kind of rooting for me to strike out <laughs> at some point especially when i was on the road uh you really don't get any of that in music in music it's all a positive and it's all about your preparation it's all about how you get ready to play a certain show and then you have a supporting cast that is you know your band members that are you know as good or even better that you could ever be uh, that, you know, that have this great rapport. And uh, then we're just making music, we're making art and uh, we're, you know, uh, putting uh, this music out there for people to listen and enjoy and, uh, and, and have a great time with. Uh, uh, not a lot of different from baseball, you know, you play your best, you know, to try to get people to, to look at you and obviously the result of the team that they're rooting for will be a, a good one as well. But uh, in many ways, music and sports are a little bit different uh, just because of that. You can get into the music with all your heart and, uh, and, and soul and have a positive reaction every time you go out there because everybody's rooting for you because everybody wants to be entertained uh, and everybody wants to hear good music. I'm going to take you into the way back machine, Bernie, back to 1991, you debut with the Yankees. I actually started covering the Yankees as a beat writer in 1991 for the New York Times, and I... I remember you arriving in the clubhouse, but I remember Stick Michael saying, watch this kid, watch this player. We're, we're going to let him mature. We're going to give him a chance. 
he's going to be the next great center fielder for the Yankees. How much did having the backing of somebody like Stick Michael, because those first couple of years, you were still finding your footing. You were still finding your way. Yeah, he was uh, nothing short of instrumental. And uh, I think if I didn't have that uh, backing of somebody so high in the organization, kind of rooting for me and letting me struggle with my, what I would call, for lack of a better expression, growing pains, uh, I don't think I would have been able to stay on the team as long as I did. Uh, I heard stories about him kind of like, you know, sort of uh, misleading a little bit of Mr. George Steinbrenner into you know, making them think that they were trying to trade me, but nobody really wanted me, so they were stuck with me. And uh, a, a lot of stories like that, that uh, obviously make me feel uh, great uh, and appreciate it. Uh, and uh, just so proud to be uh, a Yankee, so proud to be a Yankee for all these years. But it took a lot of work, and it took a lot of people that believed in me, like like uh, Gene Michaels, you know, Buck Showalter, you know, obviously Joe Torre and all those guys. Uh, and they look at things that I could do back then uh, that I couldn't even see myself. And they were projecting, you know, when you know when uh, uh, G. Michael said to you, "Look at him." They never said that to me. <laughs> They just let me go, you know, let me go and let me perform and let me uh, develop into the player that I became. And for that, I will be uh, forever grateful uh, to, to, to them. Well, they envisioned, at least Stick and Buck did, a switch hitting, power hitter, in the middle of the order with speed. And that's what you turned into, four World Series titles, a batting title, four gold gloves. I know you're a humble guy and you're not about individual accomplishments. But when you do reflect on your Yankee career, is there something that you're most proud of? Well, I think, uh, you know, I've been asked this question uh, uh, a number of times. And sometimes my answer kind of, you know, uh, you know, deviates, you know, depending on the mood that I am. But I am usually uh, consistent in my answer about this particular question, which is uh, to be part of uh, uh, <clears throat> the process that this nation had, you know, around the time of 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know that everybody, you know, that even every people that hated New York were rooting for New York and were rooting for the Yankees because we represented not only the city, uh, but baseball. And, we, you know, we have, you know, the, uh, the prayers of the country. Uh, and uh, I remember, you know, <laughs> the guys from the Diamondbacks saying, but we're American too, you know. So <laughs> it was kind of like one of those things that uh, – uh, New York and especially the Yankees in that World Series was part of a process that was bigger than ourselves. And uh, when I answer this question, I, I know that uh, in my career, there were some moments in, in my career that I would say, well, I am witnessing uh, history to be made and to be part of that history, uh, being part of uh, that process of bringing normalcy to the country was one of the things that makes me the most proud of not only being a Yankee, but a Major League Baseball player for that matter. Yeah, very memorable time in our history. Obviously, the Yankees and the Diamondbacks playing in that World Series and the Diamondbacks prevailing in seven games. I, I hate comparing tragedies, Bernie, but since you brought up 9-11 and we know what we're going through today with the coronavirus, what kind of message do you give to your friends, to your families, even to Yankee fans who look up to you about be encouraging? that if everybody stays positive and everybody stays safe and stays strong, that there is eventually light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, exactly. Those words, you know, stay positive, stay active, uh, stay engaged. Uh, like the, the governor of a state said, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Cuomo said, you know, social distance, but uh, still engage and connected, uh, you know, with people that you love and people that you admire. Uh, that has to be the key. I think, you know, it will give you a really great opportunity to work on some things that you have really sort of put on to the wayside and, and, and things that you haven't even uh, touched in maybe in years, uh, maybe a, an opportunity to reorganize your way of thinking into trying to figure out what moves are you going to make, you know, uh, from this time on. This is a really, really rare and special opportunity if you know how to take advantage of it uh, to sort of redirect your life in a, in a more positive way. Uh, this never happens. I mean, in my life, this has, has never been happened. Uh, in, uh, you know, having an opportunity to have all this time off uh, 
I think, you know, if people would uh, take advantage of it and, and have a different perspective on how fragile life is and how we have to make everything uh, possible to live our lives to the best of our ability one day at a time. Because when something like this happens, you know, you never know if you're going to be the next one. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you try to stay connected with the people that you love and try to stay active and, and engage psychologically and mentally in things that you find interesting and make sure that you're still a better person than you were the day before. So uh, uh, hopefully that's what I'm trying to do to the best of my ability. And, uh, uh, you know, hopefully people will do the same. That's very well said, Bernie. I couldn't have said it better myself. I was talking to Jorge Posada last week, and we all know the name Core Four, and it's Posada, Edith, Rivera, and Jeter. And Jorge said to me, well, wait a second. He said, there isn't a Core Four if it wasn't for Bernie paving the way for us. So he said, slow down, everyone, with the Core Four nickname. It's a cute nickname. It rhymes. It's nice. He said, but we're not there without Bernie. How honored does it make you feel when one of your teammates says something like that well it makes me feel extremely honored and uh uh i know that uh obviously you know it was just a process that everybody kind of went through i just happened to be the one that sort of came in first and uh had to deal with you know kind of like the assembly of this uh great uh core of players uh but even myself you know if it wasn't for people like, you know, Kevin Moss and Hensi Mullins and Oscar Asakar and Andy Stankiewicz and, uh, you know, Steve Atkins and all these people that came, Jim Lurits, Pat Kelly, uh, people that came into the team because the team had this sort of change of uh, philosophy in which they were going to give players a chance to prove what they could do in the minor league system before they would do anything with them. Uh, uh, and all those people came to, into the team before I did. I, I remember coming in with, uh, I think Gerald Williams was my, my, my roommate and my teammate for all these years. And we talked a lot about the opportunity that we have been given with this organization and, and thinking, this never happens, man. We've got to take advantage of this opportunity. And uh, I think that the people that paved the way before us, you know, all those people that I mentioned, paved way for my you know, opportunity to be there. And uh, once you get the opportunity, then you work on it as best as you can to try to make it the best and then that op hopefully opens the door for more people to come in you know with the same kind of mentality and the same uh, wave of thinking that the organization had uh, I think it was a great time and we would just happen to be in the in the right place at the right time Bernie you were there during some of the lean times that I mentioned in 1991 can you describe what the journey was like to win that title in 96 and then to win again in 98 99 2000 well, uh, that's a really interesting question because I think the lean years started way before the 90s started. Uh, we, uh, I remember being in the minor leagues. Uh, my tenure with the Yankee officially started as a minor leaguer in 1986, right after high school. I spent about five and a half years in the minors, uh, just kind of like, you know, only my skills and uh, listening and uh, observing, you know, the whole dynamic of the, the big team, what we called it at, th at that time, the big team, what they were doing and how they were, you know, assembling a team and acquiring players. And we had you thought, you know, the whole uh, mentality was just to bring, you know, proven people that had already, you know, careers uh, in the big leagues to bring them into the team to try to make the team uh, competitive on a yearly basis. Uh, and uh, they were just trading uh, in, you know, the prospects and the people that would probably be valuable to get more of those pieces into the team. Uh, 96 uh, happened, you know, new administration, uh, new uh, manager, and uh, new coaching staff, you know, for the most part. And uh, I think, you know, that philosophy that uh, Joe Torre brought into the team uh, did a 180 degree change, you know, as far as, you know, the attitude, the team that has been put together uh, and the pieces that were added. Uh, you know, so, sort of took everybody by surprise. You know, you have to realize that in 96, when we won that first title, we were totally underdogs. You know, mm -hmm. a team that really hasn't been proven, had a whole bunch of new players, and we were facing probably one of the toughest uh, rotations uh, in the history of the game. You know, in that modern time, you know, the Atlanta Braves, you know, with Maddox and Clavin and, and uh, uh, Smoltz and all these guys. Uh, the fact that we won, I think everybody was surprised. 
uh, including some of ourselves. <laughs> so I was very little surprised about it too. Uh, but I have to put up probably a little bit of a pause between 96 and 98, because what happened to me personally in 97, to me, in my opinion, was the, uh, the thing that catapulted me into having the years that I had subsequently in 98, 99, 2000. And uh, if I'm in a good mood, I might count 2001 as well, uh, which was me making that last out in 97 in that last game in the wild card against the Cleveland Indians. Popping that lazy fly ball against Jose Mesa in my you know, first uh, swing, you know, that last at bat that was such an important at bat with the time run, you know, with Paul O'Neill almost broke his, his neck sliding <laughs> head first, you know, or one of those, you know, disastrous slides, you know, after a double he hit. And then it was up to me to keep the game going. And I failed miserably. I took that so hard in the off season that I trained like I'd never trained before, mentally and physically, saying to myself, this situation, I am going to be better prepared, you know, to face a situation like this, uh, like I've never had before. And uh, it just sort of took me into this sort of mentality. Physically, uh, I was getting ready, but mentally, it got me into this sort of mindset that I was going to be the best clutch hitter uh, in my mind, you know, and that I could ever be. And that sort of catapulted me into having the, the year that I had in 98. And then I think, in my opinion, I had even a better year in 99. Uh, it, Normar ended up getting the, the batting title, but 2000, you know, against the Mets. And then that series, uh, in the, you know, against the Arizona Diamondbacks. All the way up to 2003, when we played the Marlins, we were still a very competitive team. Uh, but, the, but the precedent had, had already been set as being the, the team that we were you know, starting in 98, 99, 2000, and 2001, uh, it, we had already had a reputation there. And it was be because of, uh, you know, the people that we were able to assemble together, uh, you know, the so-called core of the team, you know, that came in. Plus, you know, you have to realize, you know, the, the David Cones, the Tim Raines, the, the Daryl Strawberries, the Chili Davis, you know, the Cecil Fielder, you know, the, uh, Wade Box, you know, all these people, uh, Mike Messina, all these people that came in to be part of the team because they believed in the philosophy that we had at that time. And they wanted to be part of a successful franchise that we put together uh, with those first couple of years. Uh, I think it was instrumental in, in the success of the team. I've never heard you refer to that final out in 97 so graphically. Uh, you, you carried that with you. So, so failure, and, and I put failure in quotes because the Yankees made 27 outs in that game. You, you just happened to make the final out. Uh, but you still, that, that stuck with you for, for the future, for, for 1989 yeah. and beyond. Yeah, baseball, you know, kind of fancies itself by – this notion that we play so many games, 162, and you always have an opportunity to uh, sort of vindicate yourself. You know, if you kind of make something bad happen the day before, you always say, hey, I'll get them tomorrow. After that out, there was no tomorrow until the next year. So uh, to me, it was one of the hardest things that I ever had to face in the game, being the last out of us, you know, on a, such an important opportunity. Uh, to 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 actually rise to the occasion, that I took it so hard that uh, that became my mantra. I'm gonna try to. I mean, I may not be the best player maybe in the regular season, but I'm gonna try to do my best to make take advantage of all the opportunities that I get to be productive in the postseason. And uh, I guess it became you know kind of like what I'm noted for. Bernie, you mentioned some of the players that you were so closely linked with during your Yankee career. I have done this game with a few of them, so I'd like to do it with you. I want to hit you with a name, and I want you to give me the first word, the first phrase, or the first story that jumps to mind because you spent so much time with these guys. And I think it's fitting to start with Mr. November, the captain, number two, Derek Jeter. Um, he never made excuses. He never blamed anybody else for, you know, not coming up, uh, rise to the occasion. He led the team not by his words, but by his actions and the way that he approached the game on a daily basis. That To me, that's the, the most important thing about Derek Jeter. He carried the captain role with dignity and grace through his whole career. 
And uh, that was just, just rem a remarkable career to watch. How about a pitcher that you had a, a pretty nice straight on view from center field to watch uh, the movement on his cutter? Well, it could be two guys. We're going to go with the first guy who only threw a cutter, essentially, Mariano Rivera. <laughs> well, he did try to throw something else, you know, later in his career, become a pitcher. Uh, but uh, to me, the word that comes to mind about Mariano is blessed. He was blessed with the ability to throw that one pitch that he, even he claims that God gave him to him. And uh, he was able to dominate not only one, but I would venture to say a couple of generations of players with that one pitch when everybody in, in, and their family knew what he was going to throw and that particular day for two innings or maybe one inning and he was able to uh dominate uh his generation of players uh i think that um um uh it's just remarkable to be able to do that uh and uh i if you ask him he probably will tell you that he did not do it by himself he had a lot of help uh but uh, he was just blessed. He had a blessed, blessed career. And I made reference to another pitcher who, who used the cutter very heavily, especially later in his career. What are your thoughts on Andy Pettit? Uh, best move to first base that I've ever seen <laughs> in my career. Uh, he was one of those guys that was a complete tiger on the field. Uh, and when you would talk to him on a normal basis, you know, like off the field, he was like the most uh, like humble and mild mannered guy that you could ever meet. That same, same thing holds true with uh, Paul O'Neill, by the way. Uh, you know, he was guys that are fierce competitors and you would see them talking to themselves and answering themselves too. <laughs> it was like they're borderline uh, ins insanity uh, in those three and a half, four hours, you know, what they play. And Andy was, you know, the best money pitcher that I could uh, ever think of. If the game, uh, if we wanted to win a game and we needed to win a game, to me, Andy Pettit would be the guy uh, to, to, be, uh, in, uh, to be the starting pitcher in that, in that game. How about a, a fiery sort behind the plate and I think a fiery sort when he needed to be in the clubhouse, Jorge Posada? Jorge had no filter. He, what, the, the one thing that I admire about Jorge the most is that with him, what you see is what you get. If he doesn't like you, <laughs> he will <laughs> let you know. <laughs> but if he likes you, he'll be your best friend. And, uh, you know, the, the report that I had with, uh, with Jorge over the years, uh, being close to him and his family and him doing the same thing with, with my family, uh, it, it, was a, it was a bond uh, as baseball players that is kind of rare to have. I still call him, you know, now, uh, you know, 15 years after I retired, I still call him. I still consider him one of my, one of my good friends. Uh, so with him, his assertiveness, his drive, his motivation, and the willingness that he had to let you know what he felt, whether you liked it or not, was a, a very important team, uh, thing to have uh, as a teammate uh, and a very important thing to have on the team. Bernie, I said I was going to get back to some music. I wanted to um, ask you about a trip from 2005 because I was fortunate enough to accompany you when you were a cultural ambassador for the U.S. You went to Colombia and Venezuela, and it was a combination baseball trip. You did some baseball clinics and a music trip where you, you played with some kids and you did some music lessons. And I remember being thankful to be along that trip with you, but I also thought, what a perfect Bernie Williams trip to be able to combine his two loves. What do you remember about that trip to South America? I remember uh, quite a few things. I mean, I remember the warmth of the people. Mm -hmm. I remember how, uh, so how grateful they were to have, you know, that uh, 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 event to be thrown out for them. Uh, I was uh, surprised on how much they knew about me and my career. Uh, and I was uh, grateful to be a part of that, you know, uh, that great thing that, you know, that happened. 
uh, you know, now I know that things in Venezuela and even in Colombia are not really as well, especially for people that, you know, from this country trying to get in there. Uh, I, I wouldn't even recommend it myself. So the fact that I had an opportunity to see the country uh, before uh, it has turned into a, kind of a really hard situation to be in uh, was a blessing for me. Uh, playing uh, music, even though I wasn't as proficient as, uh, as I think I am now with the music, it was also a way to connect with people that may not, might have not been that interested in sports, but I still had that other way of communicating with them and reaching out to them with the music and the arts. Uh, to me, uh, it was one of the best trips that I've ever had uh, as far as being a cultural ambassador and, and connecting with people in a different country. Uh, and I think we fulfilled what we were out set to do, being cultural ambassadors and having this connection and this interaction with a different country and to figure out that we're not really that different after all. It was obvious how much you connected with the kids. And I think one of the memories that I will always hold true is you on stage playing your guitar with all these music students. And I don't think you knew they were going to do this, but they all popped on Yankee caps. So all of a sudden it was the Yankee center fielder in the middle of all these little wannabe Yankees who were also playing music at the same time. That, that well, memory is they, etched in my mind. They did put the Yankee caps, but they also play Spain by Chick Corea. <laughs> so you, I was like, okay, we're going to give you some respect, but now you got to give it to us too. You got to play this. So it was, it was speak, great. Speaking of your music, you were supposed to perform at the Carlisle last week for, for five nights. I'm sure, I'm sure you were looking forward to that. Obviously, like so many other things in our lives, it, it was postponed. How are you maintaining your music? Can folks out there who, who want to hear your music, are you doing any sort of live stream? Is, is that anything you're going to try and do in the future? What, what's going on in the Bernie, mu uh, Bernie music world? Well, not a lot. Uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, what I was saying before about taking this time to uh, make sure that you're even, even better prepared for what's coming ahead, uh, I sort of applied to my music. Uh, so I've been uh, sort of living like a hermit <laughs> a little bit and uh, practicing uh, all the things that, you know, whether it was time or, you know, circumstances or the fact that I just didn't have enough uh, knowledge. I am trying to catch up on all of that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have to realize that when uh, you kind of make the decision to become a musician, uh, coming from that background, that I came from, it seems to me that I'm playing catch up every day. You know, having people that are playing their whole lives and I'm trying to, you know, put myself into this situation and I want to be as prepared as I can be. So my whole thing has been uh, practicing structures and making sure that I have complete control and dominance of this instrument where I can just completely figure out something in my head and not have the guitar being a hindrance to that creativity. Uh, I think that's part of being a good musician. Uh, and uh, since this is a thing that kind of, kind of is taking a lot of my time right now, I'm really focusing on that. And uh, trying to figure out ways of, you know, putting my music uh, at the forefront and, and utilizing it to reach out to people, doing uh, the music education, working with kids, and uh, making sure that uh, this, you know, Obviously, our government uh, realizes how important arts and music is as, you know, for us you know, as a country. So, uh, uh, so the sports as well, but uh, uh, it's a lot of time for thinking. For anyone who wants updates on anything that Bernie is doing, and I'm sure they will come at some point, it's Bernie51.com. Bernie, I look forward to the day where I can see you performing again, where I can see you at a baseball game. I know we're going to get there. We just all need to be patient. Thanks so much for giving us some time today. That's right. Absolutely, man. You took me back. Thank you so much for that. <laughs>